Welcome to the monthly truck stop webinar. We try to bring you each month timely subjects as it affects the providing of insurance to motor carriers. These seminars are presented as industry updates for information purposes only. They do not qualify for any state CE credits. We do have a separate program for state CE credits. If you're interested in state CE credits, please contact our office. We present those on the first and the third Tuesday of each month in one hour segments with a total of four hours per program. We hope that you would also prevail yourself of that opportunity. If you have any questions during this program, please type them in, in the chat window. They will be answered as time allows or respond to after the webinar by email to you. If the question is appropriate, we will also share it with the other participants in uh, this uh, webinar. We do sometimes have auto, audio problems and other problems. If you have a problem, cannot hear us, or something is missing in your program, please also type in the chat window or call our office at 800 741 4084 and we will attempt to provide you uh, to correct any problems that you might have. How safe can the highways be and if so at what cost? Well simply to have no crashes you park all the trucks. That's a simple answer. But the economy is depending on trucking. Therefore, that is not a realistic approach to anything. One other thing in all this discussion about safety is that based on all statistics we have, in the past two or three years, there have been fewer crashes involving large commercial vehicles uh, per 100 miles traveled than any other time in the past history. So all the current safety initiatives have improved based on all statistics we have the safety operation of a motor carrier, of a commercial motor vehicle on our highways. Part of the FMCSA, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration rulemaking, they must also have an economic study. In other words, they balance between this is the safety initiative and this is what it's going to cost and or save the motor carrier and the public in these studies. A lot of discussions with the recent hours of service rules and the CSA has been what does this cost the motor carrier? There was recently hearings uh, in Congress where the uh, Director Ann Fury uh, submitted herself to uh, questioning by the House Transportation Subcommittee. In those, uh, she was asked a question by one of the members by saying, you're hurting the people you are paid to help. In other words, his analysis of this is that she is overseeing the motor carrier industry, therefore those are the people that, quote, she should be helping. Her response is, I'm not hired to help the motor carrier industry. I'm hired to ensure the safety of the traveling public. So her thought process is, I don't care about, or her concern is, that my focus is on the traveling public not on the motor carrier industry and my objective is to make the highways as safe as possible by influencing or making the motor carriers safety. However, this leads to the underlying question that we addressed here is, what is the cost of this? What does it cost to be safer? We're going to review some of the recent rules, both in force and proposed. In preparing this presentation, the thought has been, what does this mean to the motor carrier? In other words, I want to take her question and then look at the motor carrier. And what will it cost in dollars? And in some cases, the culture change that will have to be uh, provided by the motor carrier to meet these requirements. And how will the additional cost be paid for? Uh, the motor carrier needs to stay in business, has an obligation to stay in business, but has to have dollars to stay in business. The smaller motor carrier will be affected the most. 
we have a number of statistics, what's a small motor carrier and what percentage do they make up of the quote marketplace. Statistics show about 85% of all DOT registered motor carriers have less than five power units. Another study showed 93% had less than 20 power units. In other words, the overwhelming numbers of motor carriers in the marketplace that operate on their own business have less than 20 or 20 power units or less. Yet they must meet all the requirements and still drive the truck and make a levy. Because in most cases, the principals of these companies also are the drivers, as well as the dispatcher, as well as a lot of cases the office manager, and a lot of times, if not a driver, the mechanic. They became a trucker to have the freedom of open highway, but yet now they have to also factor in not only the customers they have to deal with, getting a load at the uh, a load that pays enough to pay for the gas, the fuel, the cost of operating a vehicle, and also comply with all these requirements. So here is the thought. Retail agents, you need to start talking to insurers about these changes to make sure they understand them and can and will operate within these rules. This is going to be dependent on their ability to, to stay in business, to obtain insurance, and to keep viable. If you're a motor carrier listening to this, you need to start looking into how these rules are to meet these rules. You need to adjust your operation and talk to your shippers about the additional cost and why you need more money. There's a lot of publicity out there that these uh, new rules cost money. This you need to share with your shippers to see if you can convince them or show that they need to provide you additional revenue to be able to meet all these requirements. If you're an insurance provider, your acceptance and pricing of your insurance is based on the past history of the individual insured as well as your book of business. As a friend of ours talked about, the insurance industry is like a marching band where the director of the band is looking backwards because we build statistical data that shows what the particular of a crash is based on certain characteristics and what those crashes cost us. However, all of our past history doesn't have any of these changes factored into them. And if these changes do reduce crashes, then how do we measure these changes? Are you as an insurance provider capturing information that your insurers are operating within these rules? And if they truly reduce costs, how do you react to it? Credits, dividends, and other means to react to it. Let's look at some of these changes. One of the rules, and we wrote a blog on this, that was effective December 21, 2014, is the pattern of violations by motor carriers management. Keyword there is management. Now, for the first time, the FMCSA can suspend or revoke operating authority of motor carriers. In the past, they did not do this. The only carrier that I knew of until this initiative started about 18 months ago and the aggressiveness of the FMCSA that was shut, motor carrier was shut down was a carpet hauler in North Georgia that was putting cocaine within the tubes for the carpet. But now they're shutting them down. If you go to the FMCSA website, you can see where motor carriers are being shut down almost on a daily basis and drivers are being taken off the highway based on uh, this new rule of patterns by motor carriers management. FMCA can suspend or revoke operating authority of motor carriers who have committed a pattern or practice of avoiding compliance or concealing non-compliance. So that's from falsified logs to just ignoring the hours of service to not maintain the vehicle to not doing the daily inspections. Who allow a person to exercise controlling influence over its operation. So now we're reaching out not only to the motor carrier, but the people individually responsible for the operation of the motor carrier. And did these people commit a pattern or practice of avoiding compliance or concealing non-compliance? In other words, we're building in not only what they're doing today, but their past history. And are they re coordinated or what has been adopted by the FMCSA thanks to CAB, the chameleon carriers. The pattern violations by motor carrier management, the first part, subpart K, is the pattern of practice of safety violations by the motor carrier management. 
they can suspend or revoke if the agency determines that a carry has failed to comply with safety regulations or attempted to conceal the same. It will examine the carry's conduct to decide whether the carry has engaged in a pattern of practice of safety violations. Again, a continuing pattern of doing this. The term pattern and practice are subjective and will be determined on case-by-case -case basis. In other words, when they see the roadside activities or the crashes that are happening where they want to look at the individual motor carrier because they feel that there are safety violations, when they get into that office, when they get and make a compliance review at the insurance office, they'll start looking at data, they'll look at information. A lot of this is going to be dependent on the reaction of the motor carrier and what they have done about some of these problems. Based on what I'm seeing here, if the motor carrier has done nothing about these problems, then they will take the next step. The motor carrier definition also includes employees, officers, and other persons that are registered or required to be registered. This could include an owner-operator with their own authority. And some of the new models we have, where we have the non-asset-based trucking companies that have moved to the settlement carrier model, even those activities could be placed back on the motor carrier itself. Officers include the carrier's management and supervisors, as well as any other anyone else that's like control authority over the carrier's safety operation. This could be a third party uh, safety uh, management uh, outsourced it. It could be another legal entity the motor carrier owns and oversees the maintenance and other things. But these are the things that will be looked at. So that's the ongoing activities. That's what's happening now. The other part of this, the subpart L, is the reincurring a reincarnated carrier. Common ownership, common management, common control, or common family relations, familiar relationship with another carrier or entity. What they're looking at and a part of the application process for the uniform carrier registration that will be effective supposedly in October 2015 is do anybody involved in the management of the, this DOT number, this motor carrier who's seeking the DOT number, have any involvement in past motor carriers? And if so, what was the safety record of those past history? In other words, they're screening the any new entities operating as a new entity in the motor carrier, not only based on what they know today, but where they came from. And if there's any management concerns, if this past uh, was to wipe out bad history, the new reg will also be uh, subject to perjury for uh, and be uh, prosecuted under a felony for perjury if they do not develop the divulge this information. Again, that's effective October 2015, which will even put more truth, uh, more strength to this requirement. Rules prohibit those kinds of relationships if the purpose is to avoid compliance with regulation, conceal non-compliance or history of non-compliance. So they're going to look at the motor carriers that the management, the ownership, the operation used to operate with and see what those safety history are. And if those past motor carriers had bad safety, then they will look at it deeper to revoke the current operation authority. The agency offices may issue an order to suspend or revoke registration of one or more of the carriers involved that would find such a solution exists. I wrote a law a number of years ago, it's post, I mean, last year, it's posted on our website, obtaining a new DOT number to wash out bad past history. In that blog, I point out that is a bad, bad situation. I still get calls repeatedly from retail agents and motor carriers who says, I cannot get a load because my shipper is looking at my CSA score. I need to start over again because I cannot straighten out my existing safety. What I'm pointing out here and in that blog was that that's a bad idea because now you will be visited by the DOT officer, the new motor carrier. Now you will be subject to more inspections because now you're on the top of the insurance uh, inspection selection system you'll have more opportunity to be visited by the DOT officer even if you have bad past history. And now with the additional part of this pattern of violation motor carriers management, which now you can have the authority uh, revoked as another, another 
point to put to bring up that this is not a new, new good idea. Retail agents, you need to talk to your insurance about it and straighten out the existing operation. The answer to it, the question is not to start over again because they do not have uh, those. Those things can lead to unintended consequences. So, pattern of violations by motor carrier management. Bad carriers, beware. You're on the watch list. You've got to clean up your act. And the important is now. Insurance providers, you've got to stay informed because what will happen is that this motor carrier that is in this investigation, the motor carrier that has a bad crash, might end up having a uh, situation where you're going to have to defend their operation in a court system, which will not be useful. Beware of the insurance obtaining an UDT number to watch out past history. Most of the motor insurance providers that we have involved in our program, UCAB, which also points out the chameleon carrier possibility. This is not a good idea. Agents, you need sometimes to get involved in this discussion. Beware of this because now there's even more teeth in it. Know who the motor carriers are hiring to control their safety program. Make sure that they're certified. They've got a good history not to get around compliance, but to conform to compliance. Remember, patterns and practices are subjective. So don't leave any room for the FMCSA to use subjective decision making when they're visiting your insurance or the motor carrier's office. So again, there is teeth now to try to keep the safe, the bad actors off the highway. We've all had a lot of discussion about the hours of service. They have been with us now going on almost 10 months. Most drivers must follow the hours of service regulation if driving a commercial motor vehicle. The point I'm making here is most is that there are two, a couple exceptions to this. Agriculture being one, if they're hauling their own product and their own trucks within a 150 mile radius and for quote short haul unquote, meaning operations less than 100 miles where the driver comes back to a starting point every day, there's some modifications in the bookkeeping or the log system that they must have. But other than that, if the vehicle is, is operated by a business, interstate commerce, and the vehicle has a GVW of 10,000 pounds or more, has a gross weight or gross combination weight, meaning uh, both tractor and trailer of 10,000 or more. It's designed to use to transport 16 or more passengers, including the driver, not for compensation, meaning that this is, and we have this a lot in Florida, where we have the agricultural workers being taken to fields or taken from, uh, as they follow the crop for the migrant workers of the states, they're subject to this even though they're not being paid, they're hauling their own employees. Or if they're for hire, if it's, uh, the vehicle is designed to transport nine or more passengers, including the driver, for compensation. So the divide between hauling your own employees and, hauling and hiring out to haul other employees or if they're transporting something hazardous. All these categories must conform to the hours of service, and those changes were consolidated into the rulemaking July 1, 2013, which we all should be aware of, and most people have attempted to conform to this. The basic regulation is a driver can drive 11 hours after they've had at least 10 consecutive hours off duty meaning for every 11 hours there must be a 10 hour rest period. They can work 14 hours, meaning that 11 of them can be driving, but the other three hours would be for loading and unloading, for waiting to be uh, on duty, for waiting to, be, to pick up a load, or for fueling or other reasons, meaning that the break is not over 30 minutes, therefore it still qualifies as on duty. Again, that's after a 10 hour. Once they have driven 60 hours in seven days or 70 hours in eight days, they might, must not drive again until they have a 34-hour restart. This was the real controversial thing. So it must, this restart must include two periods of time, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., home terminal time, meaning wherever they live. They may not use this once per, only once per week, 168 hours, measured from the beginning of the previous restart. So this is the new requirements, and uh, the FMCSA is enforcing these. 
in the discussion of this, the reaction has been this has reduced driver productivity by 8 or 10 percent. This week's Transport Topics has an article in it concerning the driver shortage. I've had questions in the past week or so about what are we doing with new drivers, driver training school, those things. This is the, the, the iceberg that we don't see all the total iceberg. This is the new problem that we'll be facing or looking at or facing now but will exasperate itself in the next uh, year or two and that's where these drivers have come from. When I dispatch a load now, if I'm a dispatcher to perform of these, before I can dispatch the first leg of that trip, I need to understand how many hours they have left in their 60 slash 70 or their 11 slash 14. I need to also factor in where they're going to be 11 hours from now or 14 hours now, depending on the loading and unloading situation. Where will they park? Another crisis, not only driver shortage, but parking spaces for larger trucks. Where are they going to rest? Will it be safe for the driver? Will it be safe for the cargo? Do we allow them to go to motels or do we have the part that they sleep in the sleeper? If so, now you have to worry about the human nature within the sleeper. Do we have auxiliary power sources with air conditioning and heating facilities? And then we also have to worry about when they have to start the 34-hour restart, where are they going to be? Because they want to do this in their home with their family. That's the whole intention of this part of it. And so we have to figure out, do they have a return load? And if so, how long is it going to take to get that return load? And how am I going to get them back to their house before they run out of the 60 or 70 hours before they have to do the restart? All this must be done before the trip starts. So therefore, I'm talking about this is not only have to conform to this, but also have to look at the culture change and also more security or more load opportunities. Uh, again, pressure on smaller truckers that do not have the sales force or the footprint as broad as some other larger trucking companies. In the public discussion from Mrs. Ferrer's hearing, she stated, the hours of service was designed to reduce the cumulative fatigue. The agency recognizes the financial impact on trucking companies. This is a much larger safety and health benefit. So what she's saying is even though it's going to reduce the, the productivity by 8 or 10 percent, which means it's going to cost the motor carrier money, that the uh, safety and the health benefit of the driver uh, overweighs any additional costs. The committee member called her out on this and says it's hypocritical. Drivers know when they're tired and when they're, they're not. They are professionals. No one regulates how many hours you can work. Her answer was, there are sufficient operating opportunities within the new rules. Focus on lawbreakers was the heart of the CSA. So that's the ongoing debate. The individual driver, the entrepreneur on the highway, I know when I'm going to work, I know when I'm tired versus having to conform with these new safety requirements and these new regulations and these new rules. This is what the, we're balancing now. In looking at some of the statistics done by ATRA and other resources, the hours of service violations, the fatigue violations, do lead to crashes or are more particular of crashes than the other basics. When you look at who's pushing the envelope, it's a smaller motor carrier. Why? They're trying to maximize the hours to gain additional income. Is this cheating or surviving? Human nature is to survive, and so cutting corners will be a tendency to try to survive, or at least that will be the answer of why they're doing that. When we look at the CSA violations and reaction by insurance providers, what's the difference between working over the hours of service, which we'll find often happens with perishable goods, produce, things that have to be done with time, versus falsifying the log. Again, I put more importance on the falsifying the law because now the motor carrier is cheating than just running over hours. The discussion for everybody is the playing field needs to be leveled, so therefore electronic logs. Many large motor carriers have electronic logs now. 
most of their drivers embrace them. They like them. Why? It saves paperwork. It takes all the subjectivity away from them. They know what they're doing every day. It's more a burden back on the dispatcher, back on the person controlling the operation to make sure that they can deliver the loads within the required hours of service. But now it's going to be uh, leveled uh, with the electronic logs. If you have an hour of service violation problem, the quick fix is electronic logs because the high percentage of the violations on the hours of service is not I'm driving over 11 hours, I'm driving working over 14 hours, I did not take my 34 hour restart. Most of it is simple paperwork and electronic logs solve the paperwork. This is why the drivers like it. I was reading a Transport Topics article a number of uh, months ago and it, basically the motor carrier said I was against electronic logs until I realized why I was. I was cheating. I don't want to do that anymore, so now I support electronic logs. A part of the moving ahead with the progress of 21st century, the map that we have heard a lot about, and a lot of our discussions here today are derivative of the map program, or the, uh, the map mandate. They mandate in that rulemaking for electronic logs. The Transport Topics headline confirmed that on March 17, 2014, the FMCSA issued electronic logs rules. The proposal required devices in all commercial motor vehicles, 10,001 GVW or larger. In that article, it says MAP 21 mandated FMCSA's write electronic log device rule. MAP 21 also mandated the FMCSA write a second rule to text drivers from coercion. This is the problem and this is why the first hours of service was challenged and then the first ruling of electric logs were challenged is that some of the industry uh, representatives, particularly for the smaller motor carrier, the smaller owner operators said that they are using these logs will be a coercion against the driver and will be used against the driver. The details of the electrical log device proposal must equip truck with, a, with these items in two years after the final rule is published. Based on the history of the final rules, the are taking input on, input on it now. Usually that window is for three to four months, so the final rule should come out by the last part of this year. If trucks already have electronic logs in their vehicles, but they do not meet the new specifications, then they will have two years to meet the new specifications. The second part of this is that certain penalties of up to $11,000 for harassing coercion a driver to violate hours of service. This is additional teeth. This is where if the driver is said, and we've discussed this before, I'm sitting in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, I'm running out of my 11 hours, I have a delivery in Naples, which is about 40 miles from here. It would take me another hour to get there. I cannot make that delivery. They call the dispatcher up and say, dispatcher, I cannot get to my destination today. I'm run out of my hours of service. I have to now stop here. The dispatcher says, go ahead and deliver it. Now, there's more teeth in this. There could be $11 fine if that driver then turns that motor carrier or that dispatcher in for making them drive those extra hours to deliver the goods. So again, the training of the dispatchers, the training of the supervisors are going to be critical in all this to balance those things. This is again where we talk about the motor carrier needs employee practice liability coverage. This is a this would not pay for those fines, but it would pay for any suit that might be derivative of these if the driver gets disciplined or terminated because they did not deliver the load, even though it violated their uh, hours of service or their speeding requirements. They set performance and design specifications for the electronic log devices, mainly so that the DOT officer can interface with those devices on their computers. That's the key component here, so that the electrical electronic log devices can be downloaded, information on them can be downloaded to the DOT officers and to the motor carriers. As a part of this, the logs must, the electronic log devices must be secured. In other words, the driver cannot alter it or erase any of the information in it. It is secure and it will not be able to be changed by the driver itself. 
in this recent transport topic often is stated in part because I thought it summarized up electronic logs are coming. It took a while to happen, but it appears at first glance that the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration did a pretty good job. If you're not familiar with transport topics, which I hope all of you are, this is the newspaper that's produced by the American Trucking Association. So this article speaks basically on the attitude of the American Trucking Association towards this. This purpose, this proposal will make it far more difficult for bad actors who skirt these rules to keep doing so. So the American Truck Association has always been a supporter of giving the unsafe motor carriers, the unsafe drivers off of the highway. An electronic log will be another ability to do this. But again, this is going back to who's this going to affect the most. It's going to affect most the smaller motor carriers who have been pushing the envelope to make those additional dollars to make sure that they can make their truck payments, to pay for the fuel, to pay for, uh, to earn the income. ATA President Bill Gray said, in, as far as his proposal, is a good way to improve safety and compliance in the trucking industry and to level the playing field, meaning that the, quote, renegades, the smaller truckers, the people who are not uh, cognate of this or who are not uh, sensitive to this can run around these things. The agency wrote the proposal broadly, enumerating s essential functions for e electronic log devices, but not mandating specific manufacturers or type. This was a discussion that was in this whole thing, what kind of device could be. And the FCCA backed away from saying it has to be purchased from a indiv in the individual manufacturer or any individual type it is broader basis. Mainly the three concerns are it can be downloaded, it measures the activities of the truck by monitoring the engines and monitoring the speed, second, or when it's being moved. Second is it is secure, it cannot be uh, erased or changed by the driver itself. And third, it can interface with the DOT officer's software so that when a truck gets stopped, the DOT officer can download the information onto their system to review the information that is uh, of the driver's hours of service. So that's the part of this. Electronic logs will be with us before the year's over based on this, or at least the two-year cycle will start. So here are my thoughts. Motor carriers who are not using electronic log devices now need to start looking at them getting them installed, find out how they're going to finance them. Again, the cost of those things, five to $8,000, uh, the projected cost of them are, are thought to go less as there is more demand on it, like computers and other things. When there's more demand, it seems that the cost of those items get less and less. The retail agents need to talk to their insurers and start planning about these things. Which device is best for their operation? In other words, how they're going to download it. Some of this is even starting that now you can even use some of the devices on the cell phones and other things that you need to look at or some devices like that. What's best for me? How will it affect the operation, meaning more planning now, because you won't be able to push the envelope. You won't be able to go that extra 30 minutes or extra hour or extra two hours to deliver the load. What's going to happen in this case is that they not only need to communicate this to the driver, they must understand these restrictions, and they also must communicate this to their customers, to the shippers. This again, where this new rule can be used as information devices from the information from the motor carrier through the or the retail agents to their shippers, to their support uh, suppliers of loads, to show that now they have to make sure that when they leave that load that the driver can get to the destination within the required hours of service and within the speed limit. They will also have to start informing and training the drivers now, not only how to use it, but the importance of staying within these rules. Insurance companies, there's information that reflects electronic logs do reduce crashes. In fact, some of the carriers I'm here on and some of the agents I'm talking about, this is the number one thing that can reduce the crashes is these electronic logs. So are you as insurance provider capturing with application or at crash time if electronic logs were on the vehicle involved in the crash and of what effect they may have had in crash reduction in the whole book of business and also the cost of claims. Or, and this 
in a lot of cases it would be the negative cost because electronic logs were not used and or the rules were being violated. Again, these are things that need to be factored in now because we're going to see those happening and be effective with them within the next two years. Another proposal from Map 21 was the national drug and alcohol testing clearinghouse for commercial truck and bus drivers. Employers, that's your motor carriers. But it's not only the motor carriers that we're dealing with that we think in our book of business or the discussion that we normally have, that's the for hire motor carriers. This is anybody who is required to have a CDL driver's license. So it's not only the motor carriers we see on the highway, the big 18-wheelers. It's anybody who has a vehicle, 26,001 GVW or larger, and or has a vehicle that hauls more than or 16 people or more, including the driver. Those are where the CDL drug testing requirements fall. So for you who listen to this who might not write just long-haul trucking, who you write the contractor, the local delivery company, who writes uh, the local uh, uh, church, or even to the effect of the mechanic who's test drives large vehicles. This is where you need to also factor it in. I mentioned churches. One of the things that I did many years ago, because I was on the quote insurance committee of the First Baptist Church of Fort Myers, because we had a bus that had 22 seats in it, we had to set up requirements and mandated that any one church volunteer person, the preacher, his assistant or her assistant would have to be, have a CDL and then that process would have to be drug tested. That didn't float well, but anybody who has a vehicle, 26,001 GVW and drives it for any purpose, where it's loaded or not, test driving or not, moving from point A to point B, must have a CDL and or if the vehicle has ability to have more than 15 people in it, including the driver, they must conform to the drug testing regs. So current federal regulation requires employees to conduct mandatory drug tests of CDL drivers. I just went over who is required to have a CDL commercial driver's license. The proposed rule would create a repository and require employees to conduct pre-employment screening for all new CDL drivers and annual search on current drivers. In other words, now even after the drug test is done on a local pre-hire, the FMCSA will require the employer, potentially new employer, to check the drug database to make sure that that driver had not had a past failed or refused drug test and also must do this on an annual search. Fortunately, at this point in time, there's no cost to this, but it is another except for the time and the search to do it. The employees would also be required to inform uh, record information about a driver who, in other words, they this is the data going in to the clearinghouse, to the repository of this information. Any driver who's failed or refused a drug test, or and then even ones who have successfully completed a substance abuse program and is legally qualified to return to duty. Again, those are things that you would need to look at uh, to make sure that they conform to those things. So two steps. The motor carrier, the employer, anyone who requires the driver to have a CDL before once this is in place and this final rule is done, they have two responsibilities. Before they can hire that driver or on an annual basis, they must report or must screen the driver or look at the driver database to see if that driver has failed or refused a drug test, both again on pre-employment as well as annually and also must report their own drivers in that database if those drivers fail or refuse a drug test uh, in those areas. Most of this is not roadside activities. The last statistics that were looked at for the FMCSA in this show that less than 0.2 percent, in other words, a fraction of a percent of the are violations at the roadside. Most of these are the pre-employment 
and the random drug testing that are done internally. That the FMCs they currently have no records of those. So the roadside drug test, uh, where the DOT officer stops a driver and there is a suspicion of a drug problem, is not. Uh, is not the driving force here. It's what the motor carrier is having to do with their drug test for pre-employment and for random drug testing. This is where this data is going to come from. If you use a private third party, again, the laboratories that are doing these drug tests, they will also be required to report this. So in other words, if you send a driver down to the laboratory to have a drug test and that driver fails that drug test and never comes back to your location, you might or might not have the opportunity to report that. But the drug testing facility will have an obligation to report the drug test. So therefore, they're trying to make sure that you cannot skirt around it, hide it, or mask any of these things. There is a concern here. like the uh, MVRs and PSPs that we have here, uh, any kind of the driver has their privacy potentially violated, there must be a consent form signed by the driver. Again, if the driver does not sign the consent form, then it would be foolish or it would be against the rules for the uh, driver to be hired. So the consent form must be signed because a drug test must be done. The drug test requirements, as stated today, is pre-employment. Before being hired to drive, meaning before they can be put behind the wheel, they must pass a drug screen. Uh, that drug screen must be in possession of the motor carrier in their employment file before the driver can actually drive. They're also subject to random drug tests. This is all CDL drivers operating under the uh, motor carrier's DOT number. Twenty-five percent of that pool must be drug tested for alcohol annually, and 50% of the pool for controlled substance. This again is a burden on the smaller motor carrier who have few drivers. They must relate themselves to a consortium where the pool is bigger than that, where the pool is uh, larger than that. I get jokes sometimes, I'm owner operator, I drive my own truck, that means I have to drug test myself? Yes. Well, how do I random drug test myself? Again, join the pool. Post crashes also. This is the one that's critical at claim time because what this says is if a fatality happens, whether insurance at fault or not, has nothing to do with the fault. If somebody gets killed in the accident, a case that Greg Fury pointed out that one of his insurance had where the driver was in his hotel room asleep with his truck legally parked in the motel parking lot and someone ran off the highway and ran under the trailer that killed themselves. Again, everything legal. Driver not even driving it, sitting in his ho or sleeping in his hotel room. That driver still had to be drug tested uh, because there was a fatality tied to his truck with his DOT number. So that's the first reportable DOT reportable accident. There's also two other bodily injury and towed, meaning if medical attention had to be provided away from the accident site or one or more of the vehicles involved in it had to be towed. And if a citation is issued, then you have to be drug tested. If no citation is issued, then you do not have to be drug tested. The reason this is critical is that if you go into FMCSA, you go to CSA, you go to the individual crash history, it shows there whether the cause of the crash, meaning fatality, bodily injury, or towed, and it shows if a citation issued or not. And therefore, this is a government-mandated drug testing, and drivers should be aware of this, as well as motor carriers. And who is aware of this is plaintiff's attorneys, because one of the things that they will suspend or subpoena is the drug test if one is required. Post-crash test, alcohol must be tested two hours following accident. This is not riding the white, uh, walking the yellow line. This is making a body fluid deposit in a recognized facility. So again, you would have to have a nationwide drug testing facility that you can send your drivers to. If you can not in two hours, you've got to say why. Why? Because I'm on in Montana, I'm, within, I'm not within two hours of any facility, but then you have to do it within eight hours if you cannot do it between the first two. That's the major cutoff. 
Again, if I can't do it in eight hours, I have to have a reason not to. That reason must be valid. That's for alcohol. Other substance within 32 hours. Again, why it was not done. This is critical in the defending this case. My thoughts here, though, is something that might have a conflict, and I suggest that you talk to your work cop carrier, your liability carrier, and to your attorney. For post crashes, you must drug test when required, and you must drug test the eight drug panel mandated by the FMCSA. However, if there's not a fatality or a citation is not issued, then I would suggest not to drug test. Why? Because if you drug test, even when it's not required, this is subject to subpoena and subject to be brought in court. And that's one of the things that the motor, that the plaintiff's attorney will fish for. And we do not know that for fact until after the fact. This could have a problem with the work cop carriers, drug-free workplace requirements and the credits in some states for that. You need to balance that. But my basic philosophy in dealing with most of the attorneys we're dealing with here is don't give the place attorney any more ammunition than they have to. So don't drug test unless you are required to by the FMCSA. Again, any fatality, any bodily injury, air toad, where there is a separate citation issued. There's a couple other things that we need to be aware of uh, as we're moving forward uh, to this. The medical examiner certificate or certification. This is a program to try to alleviate or relieve the ability of a motor carrier to select their um, medical examiners and control those examiners. Uh, as of it's May 21st, 2014, the only people who can do medical uh, DOT physicals will be someone who's been certified, meaning they have sent in their criteria, have passed the test, and now are on a certification list. I just looked up the ones that are in my geographic location, and there are 25 medical examiners who are certified to do DOT physicals now listed in our Lee County area. The problem you have here is that you, if you have risk with rural areas or areas that are not as metropolitan as others, and their current provider might not be able to do this. So this is close to May, folks. This is in April. We're talking about a month from now. So we need to start discussing with your medical examiners who are doing DOT physicals, if you're motor carrier or if you're retail agent, this is something that would be helpful to you inform your insurance. Question is, who's doing your medical DOT physicals today? And second is, go look at the medical examiner certificate list. You can go on FMC. FMCS website, and you can download in any by zip code, or excuse me, by area code, any the medical uh, people who are qualified are now certified to do those things. And you got to make sure that your current provider is on it, if not, choose another one to be able to do this. Again, this is to assure that the information or the driver physical uh, condition meets the standards. Some of the discussion of this is that there will be some weeding out of current drivers because now this medical examiner will be more uh, protective of their own certification because now since they're certified, there's more liability than that. They're going to have to conform to the FMCSA regs and rules. Part of we see that legal discussions later, if they ignore those things, the medical examiner could be brought into any case, any accident, again, looking for the deep pockets. If the accident was caused by a medical condition that the medical examiner sh should have or could have caught. So this is there. The cost of these exams will probably go up too, getting again the whole thought about the cost of meeting these new safety requirements. Who's going to pay for them? But you need to start thinking about those things now as we go through. There's also a long discussion about the violation charges of part of CSA. Those were reflected in the pre-employment screening program, which is the driver's activities that's a part of the CSA. It now has a reg that if the citation is either dismissed or declared not guilty, 
the violations will be removed from the CSA, the PSP. So what this is going to require is motor carriers and drivers themselves to track their CSA scores, to track their roadside activities, and if they get cited for a violation, they need to contest that in the court systems. And if it gets dismissed or found not guilty, I'm not talking about a lesser charge. That's not legal anymore. I'm not talking about the personal vehicles. I'm talking about the ones involving inspections and CSA and commercial motor vehicles. If again the the OT officer citation gets adjudicated uh, not guilty or is dismissed, then that information needs to be sent immediately as soon as possible back to the state, back to the officer who uh, wrote the original ticket to have those actions removed. This is a positive thing uh, that has been brought up and there is uh, more scrutiny to make sure that the record will be uh, a sponge of these uh, citations that were not upheld in the court system. One of the long awaited FMCSA rulemaking that's projected to be sometime later this year is the final motor carrier safety fix determination. This is to replace the current satisfactory unsatisfactory, conditional, and unrated that we found. Some of you would look at our blogs to realize that 70, over 75% of the motor carriers are unrated. Today to get a fitness determination as shown in the federal web pages, there must be a full compliance review at the locations, at the insurance location, which only 2% or so of motor carriers ever get checked and has nothing to do with current roadside activities. The CSA safety fitness determination, when completed, the new one, will do away with the standard compliance review that we have now, and, and then they'll use their own side, the roadside inspections uh, experience to judge the motor carrier safety performance. So instead of looking at a full compliance review at the insurance office, they're going to look at the inspections on the roadside. The CSA basic scores, along with the accident, uh, performance will be used for the motor carrier safety rating. The safety rating could change monthly as the scores will change. If and when it's, this happens, again, it's been put off now over three years because there's, the, again, and we're going to talk about that before we get through here today, the non-viability of some of this information. The motor, uh, it will be a new day for the motor carrier safety rating and something that will, we, the insurance industry, shippers will have to be extremely confident of. The motor carriers should be doing everything in their power to improve their roadside inspection performance now because if you remember, that's a two-year program and anything that's going in now could be subject to this new determination later when it's rolled out. The rating would be unrated, satisfactory, additional, and unsatisfactory. That will be replaced now by, based on their discussion, marginal, or continue operating, marginal, and unsafe. Those are the new proposed rules. I'm not sure what it's going to be, those determination. And instead of having the full compliance review, which now would we say the would we look at the on-site operations taking two or three days that gets a satisfactory rating, there'll be more non-rated reviews at the insurance location office, but neither one of those will have an effect on the safety fitness determination. It'll be the roadside activities. And that's the um, the promise to finish the CSA. In this, the CSA debate is as flawed. Overdrive magazine in the March issue had a couple articles that as we conclude this discussion talks about the CSA and when you couple in the flaws that the studies are shown as well, which is not an accurate measurement of safety but a peer pressure, meaning that they're looking at a, a, a a relationship to someone else, not their own activities, uh, that factor that in that eventually this might be how they will be determined as a safety fitness determination, which could cause a problem for both getting loads and insurance to us. This is the debate that we'll have to continue to look at and be cognizant of when all this gets finished. There's a GA, GAO report that false the CSA scoring. This was mandated by MAP 21. This report recommended that the CFA change the system due to the very shortcomings found in the study. GSA 
GAO study found that the data being used to score tremor is inconsistent due to variances in inspections and enforcement policies state by state. Again, a lot of data we showed you where certain states have more violations types than others, being Arizona for non-speaking English, Indiana for speeding. Scores for smaller carriers are, are likely to be flawed just because there's not enough dollar, enough information there. There's not sufficient information there because they don't have enough vehicles on the highway, that they don't have enough data to be measured. A large chunk of the regulation used by the, SM, the safety measurement system score calculation aren't valid enough to strongly associate them with a crash risk. Driver fitness is shown not to be a measurement of, of safety. These general lacks of, of correlation between SMA scores and crashes occurrence, and majority carriers rated as a high risk not have not no crashes at all. So that's the flaw. Yet, as Kevin Jones said in the Overdrive magazine, the American Truck and Research Institution found that less than 2% of drivers say CSA has any very effective improvement of safety. On the uh, knowledgeable test, drivers scored 42% of knowing CSA score and the roadside inspectors only scored 67%. When I look at our designation passing ratio, I'm trying to get over 70% in those, yet the people who are involved in the system don't even know the system itself. CSA training has increased the stability, but 28% of the respondent safety carriers have increased the use of mandatory incentives for safety uh, for behavior. In other words, this is part of the discipline program where they get rewarded for um, for doing the pre-trip and get penalized if they don't. More than half of all drivers indicate CSA had influenced them to conduct more pre-trip. In other words, the fear of being stopped and the lights not burning or the tires not being of enough tread or having enough air are causing them to take more time. Only 2% of drivers feel that CSA has any effect in improving highway safety. Again, the drivers themselves say it doesn't help. 21% feel that CSA has been very ineffective. 28% of the drivers reject loads and equipment they otherwise would have accepted under the pre-CSA safe stack. In other words, now drivers are saying, I cannot take that load because I cannot deliver it within hours of service without speeding. I'm not going to haul that equipment, particularly intermodal, because it's not safe. This again has a discipline that the dispatchers need to understand because the drivers have this right and if the driver refuses to do it because of safety concerns, safety purposes here, then they have whistleblowing protection and if they sue, this is important because they're taking job discipline action and might be termination or reducing pay or fines, that's a part of EPL, poor practice liability, mayor's concern. 38% of employees driving and 50% of point on operators, least the carriers, have accessed their employee CSA score. That's un, un amazing. It's available on the web. They have not taken time to do that. Retail agents, as you know, we have a program to assist you to do this. We have a program that's, that's unique to our program that allows you to register your DOT, uh, your insurer's DOT number, and get their monthly rating score from them, and then share this with the insurer. Only 29% of the drivers have access to the personal inspection data available, PSP. Before I go to another employer, I'd want to see what the score says. They have access to that. 53% of the drivers oppose using CSA data to measure driver safety. Again, the industry is saying, and this goes back to the safety fitness determination, is going to be determined by these roadside inspections. Half of the, over half the drivers are opposed to this because it does not measure safety. That's this webinar. The concern that we had and what led us to bring this to you is all these new safety regs and rules. It's going to influence our, dri our motor carriers, both their cost, their driver shortage, who they can hire, how they operate. These things will be from electronic, from the cost of equipment like electronic logs on board to having more drug testing to worry about being put out of business if they violate these regs and these rules. I hope you find this useful to you. Again, if you're a motor carrier, I encourage you to be prepare yourselves for these things and be aware of these and share these with your suppliers of loads to hopefully increase their ability to pay you more. If you're a retail agent, you need to deal with the insurers to make sure they're in compliance and inform 
them how to do it and inform your insurance carriers that they are in compliance. The insurance carriers, you're going to have to start collecting this data now so that you'll be able to factor these in when you look at risk selection and risk, risk pricing in the future. I hope this hour with you was beneficial to you. We look forward to the May 8, 2014, 2 p.m. truck stop. The subject amount will be announced uh, in the uh, near future. I'm out of here.